We have had a tremendous day, one day of the camp on the Christian family and sex. And it's been a good day. We are just getting started into this camp, naturally. And there are so many, many things to cover. As I said to the campers last night, I'd say to this body tonight, I do not expect that my teaching will agree with Playboy magazine. I do not expect that the teaching of the way ministry will ever agree with what the world is saying. Because we know where all the information comes from that the world receives. And therefore, you should not expect the accuracy of the word to agree with what the world thinks. It is our opportunity and our joy to set before people who want to hear it the integrity and accuracy of God's word. Then if they want to obey it, wonderful. If they don't want to, they get the consequences. Because as far as we're concerned in the way ministry, the only thing that ever lives and that is genuine and that really works is that which is built upon the reality of God's wonderful word. In Genesis chapter 2, it says, And the Lord God, verse 7, form man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. The Lord God formed man. If God formed man, he ought to know what he was doing. It seems to me if God was not satisfied with how he formed them, he should have reformed them or done something else to get man to the place that he was satisfied. Therefore, all the talk, as far as I'm concerned, about what people think people ought to do is just a bunch of baloney. You and I have to do what the Word of God says we as men and women have to do. And the Lord God formed man. And I'm pretty sure that he knew when he formed man why he formed him the way he did. And the Word would naturally include women because God also made woman, so he apparently knew what he was doing when he was making women. In verse 15 of this same second chapter, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to what? Keep it. So the Lord God not only formed man and woman, Adam and Eve, man and woman who have a very definite part to play. And all this talk about being a homo, about being a lesbian, and you know that just recently, the last Sunday in June, the United Church of Christ ordained a homo officially in the state of California to the Christian ministry, end of quote. What a bunch of baloney. If God's word is right, praise God I ain't associated with that outfit and they're thankful I'm not associated with it too. So both of us feel pretty good. <laughs> but what bothers me is I've got way grads that are still supporting the denomination paying for it. I'd take an inventory of what I did with my money because you're going to be held accountable to God for what you do with him. Sure, they got beautiful arguments. They quote you that wonderful scripture about loving everybody. Well, bless God, I'll tell you something. I don't love the devil. When the day comes that you can read it to me in God's word that I'm supposed to love him, well, then I'd quit. <laughs> it's not in there. Well, the Lord God formed man, men and women. He didn't form men for men and women for women. Where'd you ever get that idea? You get it from the type of culture that Satan is trying to promote in our country 
that everybody who is an adult has the right of consent as to what they want to do. If two adults want to twiddle their toes together and manufacture love juice, it'd be okay as far as they're concerned. Baloney. The Word of God teaches that man was made for woman and woman was made for man. And if you don't like it, you ought to call up the management and complain to him. He's the one that set up the pattern. I get so sick and tired of everybody coming around all the time and from the census world and trying to say to us in the way ministry, well, you two, you fellows aren't loving enough. You, you, you say you're built on the word, but where's your love? Well, we got more love in our little finger than their whole lousy body most of the time. But it's not the love of what Satan is doing. It's the love of the word and what God has done in Christ Jesus. And he formed man and woman. And he made the beautiful women so beautiful because God wanted you that beautiful. And he made a man like he made him because God wanted man like that. Now it's our job to find out why God did it, to go to the Word and see what God really said man was all about, what woman was all about, and then to get our lives lined up with what the Word says. Not expect God to get lined up with what B.P. Werwell might think or somebody else, but B.P. Werwell get lined up with what the Word says as to why God form man and woman. He said he put man in the garden to dress it and to do what? I don't like that. What in the making difference whether I like it or not? It's God's what? That's right. That's right. <laughs> sure. Where did you ever get the idea that to be that Adam and Eve had nothing to do? Just to sit around, twiddle their thumbs, and play with their toenails. Where'd you get it? They call it utopia or something. Place like paradise, they say, where there's nothing to do. Oh, my goodness. When God formed Adam and Eve, he put them in the Garden of Eden. He said, look, Adam, go to work, man. Adam said, come on, Eve, let's do her. <laughs> to dress it and to keep it, Adam and Eve had to work in the Garden of Eden. Now, if the government says no work, have a Garden of Eden, that's their privilege. My Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. I want to tell you there ought to be some people in our country not eating. Because other people have to work harder so that those people who don't work can eat. And that's not the law of the order of the Christian family or of the man and woman in the plan of God in our world. God planned for man to work. He planned for man to do something, not sit around, twiddle his fingers. He had a purpose. And you never feel quite so good as when you can work. It's a wonderful joy, people, and it's a privilege to be able to work to have strength and health and life so you can work. The time you would complain is if you'd be sick or crippled or couldn't work, then you'd have something to complain about. But to be able to work, it's a wonderful privilege. Sure, I'm tired tonight. Bled my heart out all week in New York teaching, staying up for the night owls. Many nights I didn't get in till 2 in the morning. Then I'd go right back the following morning to teach. Came in late yesterday afternoon. Taught last night. Sure, I'm tired tonight, but that's my life. I've been that way for 30 years. But that don't mean a thing. You know why? Because you just renew your mind and the Word turns you on. It's the Word of God that gets rid of the tiredness. I'm not tired now. You can see that. I can stay gone till 11 o'clock, 12, wouldn't make any difference. Why? Day after day can only be the Word. Not because I'm that much better physically or mentally than any other person, or you any better than it. It's simply because of the Word that dwells in us. And He says that He 
worketh within us to will and to do his what? Amen. Amen. We got men who are not teaching the word day after day like I am, but of men who are in business, who are in shops, who work the factories and work in the, on the farms, work in the homes, the housewives. They're wonderful people, just as wonderful as I am doing the greatness of God in their life. That's right. All you need to do to get chills going up and down my spine and for me to lose all the dandruff I haven't got is for somebody to come along and simply say, well, she is just a housewife. Man, when you say that, you got me hot and bothered or something. <laughs> just a housewife. That's a disgrace. He is not just a housewife. You know, that kind of teaching permeating our country has torn out from underneath us some of the grassroots that women have been taught they're slaves just because they have to wash the dishes or clean the floors or keep the house in order. I should say not. You're wonderful women of God and you've got a tremendous opportunity. It's not just a housewife. It is a woman of God with a ministry, a mission, a purpose in life. My goodness. Look at Genesis 2.18. Uh, Lord God said it's real good for man to be alone. He said what? Right. I will make him a helpmate for him. And it's the word companion. A helpmeet is a companion. The word companion means one alongside with who brings the best out of man. That's what it says. I can't improve on that. <laughs> Neither can you. He said he'd make man a helpmate, a companion. For So the first wonderful opportunity that women of God and men of God have who are united in marriage one with the other is that the wife is a companion to the man. She's not the just a housewife. She's a companion, one standing alongside of, not one standing underneath of. Not one that's a slave to her husband. Look, the same God that dwells in Christ Jesus in me is the same one that dwells in Dotsie. Same God. And in the Christian family, God comes first. For both the husband and the wife. Right. And it's God's will that the husband and the wife have God first and follow God. Now, if a husband doesn't renew his mind on the word, or if the wife doesn't renew his mind on the word, then what does the husband do? If the wife doesn't renew her mind on the word, he still has a responsibility of putting who first? God. If the husband doesn't renew his mind and walk on the word, the wife still has the responsibility of putting who first? God. That's right. That's the order. God first. Keep your finger here in Genesis. Take a look at Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 10, verse 27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy what? And with all thy what? And with all, and with all thy, that's right, and thy neighbor as thyself. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That 
take top precedence. That's the requirement. And the same God that lives in the man lives in the woman, the husband and the wife. Therefore, both have to put God where? First. That's right. If I were a Christian man or a Christian woman, and I had done my utmost to get my companion to put God first, and she wouldn't, I'd have to move without her. Likewise on the other side. I know what it says in 1 Corinthians 7. Read it once. I'll read it again to you this week. We get to it. I know all that. But putting that together with Genesis and the rest of the word, the obligation still is that God has to come first. And it's the man's responsibility to see that he holds God first in his family. In this Christian family, I'm going to teach our people how to get the family together in Christian family worship. In the reading of the word as a family. We're going to be talking in this camp to our young people on how to date. Date is, dating is a lost art. That's right. About the only thing they have on dating today is three long segments of movie film down at, outside of Lake St. Mary's or Moton or someplace where you can go at 7 o'clock at night and come home at 2.30 in the morning or something. And every film will just basically be contrary to to what the word says in its depth. And when you get through seeing them, you've spent a night out, but you haven't learned anything that you didn't already know. And so we've lost the whole art of dating. All we know is go to a lousy picture, so. I guess, maybe a few other things. But what, what, what have you learned about a boy or a girl spending a night at the show? Oh, you may learn she kissed. Yeah, French and otherwise. You may have... Learned a lot of other things about her, you know, cuddling her. But is that the art of dating? That kind of thing you can buy down the street from anybody that isn't even a Christian. What about the Christian boys and girls? What? How can they date? How can they really get that thing up where it's exciting and alive and vital without always getting in the messes. It is possible because the Word shows us how and we're going to be in it. Because you have to seek God first with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, that doesn't mean that a Christian boy and girl walk around all evening with a Bible in their hand <laughs> yeah, and say, now look, honey, here it says chapter 17 of Leviticus, <laughs> verse 3. <laughs> <laughs> Well, bless your heart, I like you, you know. <laughs> it says in verse 21 of that great second chapter, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And from behind the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her, the woman, unto man. And that is how man received the companion, that's how it is, he is complimented. Now, a man's a wonderful, wonderful creation of body, form, made, and then the spirit created in the beginning. I know this. But man today, I'm speaking generally now, if there are genetic freaks along the way, that we'll have to handle in another vein. But generally, a man is happiest when he has a woman that'll stand with him. Someone that is a companion to him. Because she brings out the best there is. That great 
what is it, the 31st chapter of Proverbs talks about the beauty of a woman. She's, she gets blessed because her husband sits in the gate of the elders. She's blessed because her husband is such a tremendous success. And every time he succeeds, she succeeds. And she is really the one that controls the heartstrings, not only of the man, but of the whole family. Yet, the man is to be the head in that family, not to lord it over the wife, but to be the leader, the one who sets the example, the one who says, look, honey, this is what will bless our family. The husband doesn't sit down at the table and say, well, Mom, you ask one of the kids to pray. <laughs> yeah. Because Dad doesn't know how to pray or he's ashamed to pray. The father sits down at the family table and he says, Honey, you and the children bow your heads. We pray. He prays. Then at another time, the father says, Johnny, I want you to pray. Or Maggie, I want you to pray. It's the father that puts that spiritual depth in his family. Now, it said that God made Eve as a companion. That means that woman's primary responsibility to man is companionship. No place in the Word of God does it say that she's just a child-bearing machine. That was a denominational teaching in order to increase the population so they'd have more sinners. That's all. <laughs> to have a child in a family is a blessing. But that isn't the primary purpose of marriage. The primary purpose of it is companionship. Someone you can really rap with. Someone you can talk to. Someone who understands you. Someone who endeavors to love you sometimes in spite of yourself. It works both ways. That's right. We tell all of our young people, they don't always obey us, we tell them anyway, uh, share it with them. I'm not telling the sense they have to, but we say to our young people, after you get married, don't have any children for two or three years at the earliest. Even if you're 26 when you get married, you can still have them at 29, I guarantee you. It says so in the book. <laughs> One of the reasons I say this to our people is because of our American culture. In the Bible, when they got married, they went on a honeymoon for one year. They accepted no invitations from anybody except the immediate family on both sides, you know, husband and wife, both sides. They learned to live with each other. They learned to, to get along with the in-laws. That's not too bad an idea. You see, in our culture, you get engaged today, married tomorrow morning, go to bed tonight, and the morning after that, you go each one to your separate jobs. She goes at 4 in the afternoon from 4 to 12. You go from 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon. And so when she leaves the door, you come in and say, Hi, honey. And out she goes, you come in. And so you live together for 20 years, have six children, and you still don't know anything about each other. That's our culture. That's some. That's why we say to our people, learn to live with each other. If you have a child the first year of marriage, you've got an opportunity to try to bring that marriage together because of our culture. 
It's difficult to have two babies the first year, your husband and then a younger one. <laughs> and if it's a secret, ladies, we'll tell you about it, that every man is always a baby. So you might as well just put it in your head. Right, women? All of us men... That's right, Errol. All the married women are going like this. <laughs> <laughs> and you might as well learn that you've just got to baby us men all the time. And we like it. <laughs> and of course, since we like it, we promote the system. <laughs> and we always know that our wives love doing this because they are so tender and kind and mothery that it just blesses them for the privilege of mothering us. It's a beautiful trip. Well, <laughs> still the first prerequisite of a marriage is companionship. And boy, if you're going to have companionship, you've got to be able to rap. You've got to be able to talk. Somebody just, uh, the husband can't say something, the wife immediately get teed off. Or the wife say something, the husband get all upset. It's got to be a rapping session, a talking session. You've got to be able to, to sit down and to talk things over. But lo and behold, if you don't have time, or if you don't take time, you just can't put it together as a Christian family. Just exactly what do we learn sitting in front of that idiot box as husband and wife all night watching outer space or something? <laughs> or the Democratic Convention? <laughs> That's for you Republicans. Now, honestly, <laughs> we got those trinkets too in our house. But when I get real honest with myself, just to, what does a person really learn? How do you communicate with husband and wife if you sit there and watch some stupid guy acting a stupid part? Even if he, even if eight men die with a six shooter at that, what do you learn? <laughs> Nothing. It would be better to take that idiot box and just throw it out and sit down and hold hands and look in each other's beautiful eyes and simply say, honey, I think you're the sweetest little thing, big thing. I don't care how you say it. Just say it. <laughs> At least I'd get some reaction. And it would. It wouldn't be the TV causing it. Now, you see, you've got to have time to talk. You have to have time to relate one with another. It's just a tremendous opportunity to build that companionship. And I think all of us know many so-called Christian families that have children and everything, but they lack that companionship. And in that companionship is the sweetness of the walk. I think, Elena, have you got it in the book that you're publishing, the one you're writing on the way, Awareness of His Presence? That's my old heartbeat. You'll be the first one that's ever published it for me. That's part of my believing of the Christian family. It's not that she's always there mopping floors, or when I come home, that she's always there. You know, she's got to go to the hairdresser every Friday. You know that. <laughs> and she's got to do a few other things. But it's just knowing that she'll be there. Or just sometimes, you know, she's in the kitchen. You're back in the office someplace. Just the awareness of her presence. Whether you rap, whether you talk all the time, that's not what I'm talking about. It's just knowing she's there. For her to know 
just know he's there. It's the awareness of his presence. That's why a man can't call the boys every night and say, hey, John, let's go bowling. Tomorrow night, hey, Herman, let's go bowling. That's right. Because sometimes she wants to know the awareness of his presence, too. And when you get married, you aren't marrying the guy you've been bowling with. If you wanted to marry him, get married to the ball, and you'd be at a ball. In a Christian family, you got married to the woman. Try. I'll tell you one more thing. You didn't marry the in-laws either. And that's why the Scripture says, <laughs> in Genesis 1, 28, and the Lord God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and what? And replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish, the sea, or the fowl of the air. I'm looking for the scripture where it says, Leave dad and mom. Which one? That's where I better read. I like that other one over there, too. I'm going to talk about it in a few minutes. But I wanted to show you the scripture. Therefore, shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one what? You don't become one place the night you get married to the end that you're both, you know, are like, poof, that. The one flesh trip is to bring two individuals with different minds, different backgrounds, different mothers and fathers into a companionship where those two mold their lives together so they become one. <laughs> Somebody said it'd be much easier if it was like the old wagon, just one tongue. But uh, <laughs> sorry, there happened to be two tongues, hers and his. And you have to mold people together, and they have to want to be molded. If she says, well, I'll do it my way, and he says, I'll do it my way, you might as well call the attorney now or pay him before you ever get married because he knows you're coming. That's right. And a man has to leave father and mother and bless dad and mom. Let them go. You made it. I think maybe they can make it if we just quit breathing down their neck. <laughs> That's right. When a boy and a girl get married, they ought to move out of daddy and mommy's place. Oh, if you have to stay for one day or something, that's all right. But boy, to live there and to work there, you know, and work out of there, that's not the family way to do it. A man and a woman getting married have a right to make their own life and their own decision and grow together in one place. And if they live with her daddy and mommy, it'll be an opportunity. If they live with his daddy and mommy, it'll be an opportunity because the Word says that they're to leave father and what? Mother. And mother-in-laws should stay out of the family arguments. That's right. If she can't burn the toast right, let her learn it. Mother-in-law doesn't have to come over and burn the toast. <laughs> Look, if you have to teach her how to burn the toast after she's married, what kind of mother were you before she got married? Huh? <laughs> you mean to tell me you didn't teach her anything before she's married? Now, after she's married, you want to go over and run the family? Baloney, go home, stay home. Let those young people work it out. And the first time she calls up and says, Hey, I ain't getting along so good. You say, Look, honey, burn your own toast. <laughs> That's right. There will be opportunities because you have two heads. You've got two tongues. And to build a life together, 
take the renewed mind with the love of God, putting God first, and without putting God first and having a rule book to go by, you can't ever do it. People will stay c together for convenience sake. Costs less to stay together than it does to pay the alimony. Or they'll stay together because somebody said that it'd be better for them just for the kids' sake. Baloney. It has to be built on the word. Also, that 28th verse that I read needs to be called to our attention tonight. God bless them. God bless man and woman. And then God said to man and woman, they should be what? And multiply. And replenish the earth and subdue it. And you know how I teach this the foundational class that they couldn't have replenished it had there not been something to begin with. There had to have been something at one time to occupy the earth, else they could not have replenished it. And he said they were to have dominion over the fish, the sea, the fowl, the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Man was made to have dominion. Man cannot have dominion if he and his wife are always fighting. Then Satan is already defeating them, and together as husband and wife, they cannot have dominion in the home, over the children, over the environment, over the work in which he is engaged. It's impossible because it's contrary to God's word. So the Christian family is a wonderful joy, a wonderful opportunity. Why, if you never had an opportunity, there wouldn't be anything exciting about it. It's the opportunities with which you're confronted, which you work out and put together that make it a road that is enjoyable because of the awareness of his presence or her presence. And it's a tremendous opportunity, people. Tremendous joy. I don't know if two, two people, man and wife, ever get to see everything eye to eye on everything. Sometimes I think life would be awful dull if we did. But I, I do believe that two people can so work things out that they can overcome any opportunity. I have said it before and it'll bear repeating again tonight. If you had two people born again of God's Spirit walking on the Word, I'd be glad to take that boy and that girl and marry them tonight and guarantee that if they stay put on God's Word, those two will have a great one-place trip. Guarantee it. Because this idea that you have to date for 16 years or something, nothing to do with it. Has everything to do with people getting it together. Because I know people that have gone together for a whole year or two, they never got it together after they got married. No others that only went together for one day, they didn't get together either. So the principle has to be built on the word. That's the word that sets it forth. And as that word is set forth, we build our lives on it. Then the things come to pass. When you deal with the Christian family and with sex in the category in which we deal with it in the family camp, it sets before our people the greatest positive wholeness that we know on how to walk in this world, to have companionship and joy and peace and happiness and all of this going through life. God is wonderful in his love and in his mercy and his understanding. I know the ideal way, but in our culture, sometimes you cannot deal with the ideal way. Because people have already blown it. Then what does God have to say to those? 
Well, I believe that our God is not only forgiving, but he's able to mend the fences. I believe that it is possible to come back. I believe it's possible to come back to the Father and to say, Look, Father, I blew it. I'm sorry. Now I'm going to walk. He cannot, you know, do do a, do the trip right at that moment. But if you make that decision and you start walking, he can bring together again that life or those two lives to the end that it will magnify and glorify God and bring blessing to both the husband and wife. This is why... It is always a wonderful, wonderful privilege that I feel we have when we have a camp on the Christian family. Camps like this ought to be held all over the nation, mainly for the Christian believers, that the Christians get their questions answered. I passed out a, a number of questionnaires last night and I guess this morning or something. And do you know that generally the same response that you gave here at the international headquarters was generally the same response I had at every other camp where I taught this year? The things that you considered ranked number one in the 20 to 30 age group, they ranked one in the 20 to 30 age group in California, in New York. That again corroborates what I've said through the years, that basically mankind is all the same. In their hunger, in their need, in that which they want to know. This is a time when we can again teach the accuracy of God's word, hold forth this word, show our people the greatness of it, and then we have the joy and privilege of rising up to it. If some of us blow it, it's still God's word. And when we blow it, we'll be out of alignment and harmony and it just won't work. And we're going to have to come back to the integrity and accuracy of God's Word to make it work. And in that great companionship of the Christian family lays the future of our country, of our existence in it. If the Lord tarries, that's the only thing I see that will make possible growing up the children growing up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord again. Having the knowledge of the foundational class so deeply ingrained in them that when they're 16 or 20, they never recognize when they first learned it. They've just got it from the beginning. And this is why that we're having a camp this week on the Christian family. And this is why I wanted to share this word from Genesis which is the foundation of the entire ministry of the Christian family. You go back to its first usage in the Bible, and there God tells you those basic truths, and you can pattern these now all the way through the Word of God. So we're believing for a wonderful week. We're believing for your prayers to be with us that are not in the camp. But if you'll take those scriptures that I gave you tonight and really work those, in their depth you will see that it puts together a lot of things that you as Christian parents may enjoy sharing with someone else. And that is my desire, that's my prayer for this group tonight, and that's why I gave you those sheets of paper. I wanted you to take them home with you. 